G'day and welcome to the SUV that tries to be all things to everyone, and which we should know from experience that that never really works out well, does it? The Nissan X-Trail. See, while many SUVs in this category seem to have embraced the fact that they're just basically boring, practical, high-riding hatchbacks, it feels like the X-Trail just refuses to abide by that image. It tries to look a bit tough with its boxy, rugged design, yet it's still conservative enough to not scare the other parents on the school run. The interior features tough plastics everywhere, yet it's spacious and comfortable enough for the kids, and apparently it can handle some pretty decent off-roading while still being nice to drive on-road. At least, these were the selling points when they were new, but this generation of X-Trail is now a couple of generations old, and even Nissan themselves have abandoned the entire aesthetic that this is about, instead making the current X-Trails and the previous one yet more boring, practical, high-riding hatchbacks. Which then begs the question, why? Like, why have Nissan turned their back on what this generation X-Trail was all about? Like, what actually goes wrong with them? What do they like to live with on a daily basis? What do they cost to own and operate and buy? Most importantly, but should you buy one? Now, before we answer all of those questions, let's get the basics sorted first. In this video, we're gonna be focusing on the Australian variants of the second generation T31 X-Trail, which was available from 2007 to 2013. Available here in Australia, and depending on the year and the trim spec, in a choice of front-wheel drive 2.0-litre petrol, 4x4 2.0-litre turbo diesel, or most commonly, 4x4 2.5-litre petrol forms, with, and again, depending on the trim spec, a six-speed manual or a CVT automatic transmission. We should mention, while the X-Trail, it certainly won't challenge the likes of a Land Cruiser or a Jeep Wrangler deep in the wilderness, thanks to its all-mode 4x4i all-wheel drive system, the T31 can handle far more serious off-roading than the vast majority of other SUVs in this segment. In terms of the variants, here in Australia, the petrol engine diversions were split across three different variants, while diesel models had to make do with two. The X-Trail also received a midlife update in 2010 and a, another smaller update in 2011. Now, we will be covering way more about the trim specs and the updates later in the video, but you know, we can't go through all the graphic specifics of them because it would just take forever. We'd be here for hours. So instead, we have gathered all of that information and we've put it in our incredibly handy and totally free Redriven cheat sheets that are available at redriven.com. And we've also popped a link down there somewhere. Okay, so what's it like to drive? Well, full disclosure here, I actually used to own one of these, but it has been many years since I've driven one. And the immediate feeling you get driving it again there's no fooling you into thinking that it's trying to be a car. It's definitely an SUV. Like after this many years and thousands of kilometers, it feels like you're driving a little truck. Like it kind of bounces and bobbles around all over the place, but just the right amount. But because of that, I feel like it has its own sort of charm and character. And that's something that a lot of SUVs in this market lack. Now, something that I used to notice with my X-Trail, and this one does exactly the same thing, because the interior is mainly hard plastics and you're basically sitting in a box, it feels like the cabin acts almost like a hi-fi speaker in the way that any rattles or squeaks or noises are just amplified. Now, that may bug many of you, and I'll be honest, it would normally bug the hell out of me as well, but because those rattles and squeaks and noises somehow kind of suit this car, it just sort of adds to the charm. Now, my extra was a manual and this one is a CVT, and I tell you what, I instantly prefer the manual. The CVT in this, look, it is smooth, it's easy to use, it, but it does all those typical CVT things like the weird kind of whine between gears. And look, if you just must have an automatic, fine. Although, look, in saying that, Nissan CVTs, they do have a horrible reputation when it comes to reliability. We'll, we, we will be covering what goes wrong with these gearboxes later on in the video, but I don't know, I just feel like after owning a manual, it does feel like the CVT, CVT just kind of ruins the experience. Now this particular extra oil has the 2.5 litre engine and it does the job. Look, it's not a performance car, it was never meant to be a performance car, but like overtaking doesn't require any huge levels of bravery at all. It pulls along pretty nicely. Now, quite a few owners of the two litre front wheel drive X-Trails have complained that they feel their X-Trails lack a few horses under the bonnet. So if you are in the market for one of these or one of the front wheel drive two litres, make sure you go on a test drive and give it the beans and just make sure you're happy with the amount of ponies under the bonnet. Now look, it is a pretty decent sized unit of an SUV, but because the glass house is really large and because it's basically a box on wheels, it's really easy to judge all the parameters of the car if you know, trying to maneuver into a tight parking space. And also because the steering is quite light, there's a good amount of communication through it. Yeah, it's easy to judge. So look, overall, what's it like to drive? Okay, well, imagine what it would be like to drive like an old school Land Rover Defender, okay? And then imagine what it would be like to drive a Toyota Camry. This sits like right in between those two. 
Okay, so interior wise, for me, it's just the right level of rugged in here. It's not like 70 series Toyota Land Cruiser levels of rugged, but because everything's made from like bloody hard plastics, feels tough. Even design wise, it's just simple and functional. Like there's the center console there. Here's the gear change here. Everything is just super easy to use. Now wear and tear wise, because everything is mainly made of really hard plastics, the wear and tear is really good. I should mention, this is this owner's everyday car. They have multiple kids and it does get let's be honest, abused, but it feels good. Like everything, everything feels nice. Even like the, you know, the le okay, leather on the steering wheel is getting a bit shiny, but that's easily restored. The leather on the seats actually still quite soft. It's, I wouldn't go as far as saying supple, but quite nice and can be restored to being better than that with a, with a solid detail. But all the plastics up here, like a few little scratches there, but that's to be expected. Wear and tear for what this car does, spot on. Now, in terms of practicality in the front, Heaps, here we go. So storage bin on top of the dashboard here. There's a spot sort of kind of for a phone there, but when you accelerate, that's gonna slide out. Storage spot under the infotainment system here, which again, sort of kind of holds a phone. Spot here next to the power outlet. There's two cup holders here, storage bin here. Decent sized door bins that just hold a re-driven water bottle. Bit of a squeeze, but they can get in here. There's a uh, spot for life's filth just here and a massive, massive glove box that is also cooled if you want to throw any cold drinks in there, but that is, that's got to be one of the biggest glove boxes I've seen. Besides that up front, oh, and also more cup holders on top of the dashboard there. Oh, and also a sunglasses holder up here. Now in the back seat, I'm exactly six centimeters taller than another tough and rugged yet charismatic and popular figure, Mr. Bear Grylls. This is in my driving position. And it's interesting. First of all, you know, the seats can adjust in how reclined they are, which is really handy. And the seats themselves are very, very comfortable. And it does feel airy and spacious up here. So from kind of this level and up, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel claustrophobic at all. But then from here down, it does feel a little bit claustrophobic. Like my knees are just scraping up against the backs of the seats. I do have room, but maybe because it's quite dark in here, I just feel like my lower body's a bit like hidden. Now, as far as wear and tear goes, as I mentioned, this is this owner's daily driver and there are kids back here all of the time. And wear and tear is pretty good. Like there's a few little scratches and stuff here and there, but not too bad. The leather's wearing really, really nicely. Again, still nice and soft and supple. Even on the, the backs of the seats are quite good. Obviously it gets used, but it doesn't feel, doesn't feel abused. Now, practicality in the back seat, you have, first of all, an enormous huge armrest so you can keep the kids separated so they stop fighting and having tantrums all the time. I don't have kids, I don't know if that's how it works, but it seems to work. You've got mat pockets on the backs of both seats. You've got a pretty small little door pocket down here. I don't know what you're gonna fit down there, maybe some pieces of Lego or some McDonald's chips. Uh, more spots for life's filth just there. And also, oh, air vents here, but the highlight of the back seat, the coolest cup holders ever. It's like a transformer. Look at that, awesome. Okay, practicality in the boot is absolutely superb. First of all, heaps of space back here, but because everything's made of you know hard plastics, it's super easy to slide things in and out. Plus, the seats fold flat. So again, easy to slide things in and out. A mountain bike will definitely fit in here. There's a power outlet here. But one of the best features of all are these drawers, which obviously, yes, you can store things in. But I know from experience, if you take this drawer out, we're not sponsored by Pioneer, but I know you can fit from experience a Pioneer XDJ RX2 DJ controller in here perfectly, doesn't slide around. And in this one, you put all your leads and stuff for your PA system. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant practicality in the back. Now, what levels of tech and features these come with will depend a lot on the year and more specifically on the spec, but even on the base model ST, it comes with a decent amount of standard kit. For example, Entertainment is taken care of via a four speaker stereo with a CD player. You'll stay all comfy thanks to air conditioning, a leather tilt adjustable steering wheel and height adjustable driver's seat, while remote keyless central locking and cruise control will help make the daily commute easy. However, step up to the STL or the diesel variant TS and you can expect Stylish 17 inch alloy wheels, front fog lights and chrome exterior highlights to fancy up the exterior. Six speakers and an in-dash CD stacker with MP3 compatibility to lift the quality of the tunes and climate control for the air conditioning. Topping off the range, the petrol powered TI and the diesel variant TL gets leather seats that are power adjustable and a sunroof. On top of all that, Bluetooth was added to the range in 2009, while the 2010 update saw a host of extra equipment and features added to the range, like parking sensors, a reversing camera, heated seats, and loads of other stuff. 
Also, obviously, these are a little bit too old to feature Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, but being a standard DIN fascia, it's easy to install that with aftermarket equipment. Now, in terms of safety, ANCAP tested the X-Trail back in 2007, where it received a four-star result. But remember, that was 15 years ago, so that equates to maybe a one- or two-star result these days. However, despite the shitty ANCAP safety rating, it does come with a decent amount of safety features and kit. And to talk you through what it has, I'm going to do another voiceover, but this time I'm going to do it in that, that kind of Bear Grylls, Steve Irwin kind of adventure show kind of way. Right, the key to staying alive in the X-Trail starts even before you hit anything. And this Nissan, it's one beast that'll have your back with anti-lock brakes, brake assist, electronic stability control, traction control, and even hill start assist. But if the wilderness does attack you when you're least expecting it, the six airbags, active front seat head restraints, and front seat belts with protectioners will do their bloody best to keep you alive, even if the worst were to happen. Again, for the full breakdown of all the tech and the safety features, jump on to redriven.com and check out that sheet sheet. Okay, so what goes wrong with these? Actually, before we get into that, just have to give a massive shout out to all of the Nissan X-Trail owners groups and everyone that assisted us with the research for this video. You guys are all legends. Okay, so what goes wrong with the exterior? Well, you know what? In the research that we did, we found that not a whole lot goes wrong with the exterior. Like there are the, you know, the odd sporadic reports of you know, door lock actuators and some electronic gremlins here and there, but not common at all. Like, yeah, as I said, sporadic issues. However, in saying that, we did find that some of the problems that these have are generally due to abuse, like abuse off-road, or dodgy repair work after an accident. Which is why it is absolutely critical to make sure you have a pre-purchase inspection done, make sure it has a full and thorough service history. But to make the entire pre-purchase experience easy for you guys, we've made the ultimate 4x4 buyer's guide and ultimate used car buyer's guide. The links are down there in the description. Honestly, please watch them before you buy any used car, not just an extra trial, because it could save you thousands. Now inside is pretty much the same case, like look, they're not perfect, there are the very odd and sporadic reports of some buttons not working or some electrical gremlins, but after reading through a bunch of you know, customer satisfaction surveys and reliability reports, the vast majority of owners stated that they've never really had an issue with the interior of the X-Trail. Now guys, before we get into mechanically what can go wrong with the X-Trail, look, the only way that we can keep making these videos for you is with your support, and the easiest way of supporting us is simply by hitting the like, subscribe and bell buttons down there and sharing our content as much as you can. Honestly, doing all that helps us out so, so much. Okay, now mechanically, what goes wrong with the X-Trail? Look, I'd love to tell you, but I can't because I'm not a qualified mechanic. But you know who is? Jim. The less popular two liter, that's the MR20 that's in the two wheel drives, it's a pretty reliable engine. Worn and rattly timing chains and oil consumption are a bit of an issue in poorly serviced units, but one that's been well looked after very rarely do you see any serious mechanical issues. The QR25, that's the two and a half litre, it too is a pretty reliable engine. And thankfully they don't suffer from the same chronic head gasket issues that that QR25 suffered in the T30X trail. I mean, it's not unheard of, but it's way more uncommon than the T30. They do occasionally have a rattly drive belt and that's typically from a seized overrun pulley on the alternator and it's usually fairly straightforward to fix. And at the age of them now, that means that all the engine bay plastics, especially the radiators, are starting to get a bit fatigued. So you might want to check that. The Renault-made M9R 2-litre diesel, well, it's not a bad engine, but it suffers from all of the same EGR and DPF complications that nearly all modern-day diesels suffer from. They do also have a few problems with oil leaks and there's plenty of issues with the turbos too. Before I get into the diesel, it's just started raining here, so sorry about the audio. Now the diesels are more fuel efficient than the petrols, but you've got to keep in mind the extra expensive servicing and the ex more expensive repair bill when something does inevitably br break means that the petrol makes way more sense in these things. And a fun fact, the petrol in Australia outnumbers a diesel five to one. The transmission in these, it's a JATCO CVT and it is the problem child in the T31X trail. Now Nissan don't actually schedule a CVT oil change in these things at all, ever. Feel for life, they say. You'll never have a problem, they say. No, just no. Only under extreme conditions, that's like towing or anything carrying heavy load, do Nissan even suggest you check and change the CVT oil. 
And even then they don't suggest it until 90,000 Ks, which is utter madness. If you want to greatly improve the chances of these things not shitting themselves, change the CVT oil at 40,000 Ks and the transfer case oil at 40,000 Ks too. And if you're looking to buy one, try and find some evidence that the CVT oil has been changed at least once at some point in the car's life. We should also mention, if you've noticed in this video that we've missed something about the X-Trail, can you let us know in the comments? Basically, our goal with Redriven is to make this like a, a community-driven platform of knowledge about used cars, and we generally find it's those that own these cars that are the true experts. So, yeah, if we've missed something, please let us know in the comments. Here in Australia, the, let's say, dodgy high kilometre low spec examples, they're asking around about $4,000, and X-Trail's populating the complete opposite end of the spectrum, they're asking a little bit over 20,000 bucks. Something like this, a 2012 top spec TI with under 100,000 Ks on it, and in pretty okay condition, you're gonna be looking anywhere from 17 to 19 grand. Nissan claims a fuel consumption figure of anywhere from 7.2 to 9.3 litres per 100 k's, depending on, you know, if it's petrol or diesel, manual or CVT, all-wheel drive or front-wheel drive, a whole bunch of other things like what colour it is, what trim spec, what the interior is like. This particular X-Trail, which features the most common and popular of all of the drivetrains, being the 2.5 litre petrol engine with all-wheel drive in CVT, is claimed at 9.1, but it's actually seeing 11.7. Well, it is a yes, you should buy one, although it does depend on not only the exact example of X-Trail you're looking at, but which of all of the X-Trails you're talking about. Firstly, we'd recommend sticking with the 2.5 litre petrol engined variants as the two litre, according to many owners, is a bit gutless. And even though it is claimed to return a really good fuel economy figure, the fact that you have to rev it out to get anywhere equates to eating into those fuel savings. Secondly, while fastidiously maintained diesels can potentially be a reliable thing, unfortunately many owners just fail to fastidiously maintain, resulting in expensive repair bills that again will eat into any of the fuel savings that you may have made. Thirdly, we would highly recommend sticking with a manual transmission or a CVT that has a very solid service history. As Jim mentioned, neglected CVTs can turn very, very nasty. So it is absolutely critical that you check the service book and the history of the car and have a full pre-purchase inspection carried out before you buy. And finally, look, this may seem like common sense, but obviously don't buy any X-Trails that have clearly been abused or mistreated or have like no service history. And also don't rush in to buy one because there are plenty of these on the used market. So there's always gonna be another X-Trail. Wait and get your, get your perfect one. Just be careful, do your homework and doing all that and you'll end up with an awesome SUV. So would you buy one or would you buy like a CRV or a RAV4 or something completely different? Let us know in the comments and we'll see you next week. See ya. Why? Like, why have Nissan turned their back on what this generation? Whoa, that was my brain died. Okay, here we go. Like, what actually goes wrong with them now that you? Ah, oh, can start again. Also, obviously, these are a bit too old to feature. You know, feature. Good. We have gathered all of that information and we put it in our incredibly handy and free. Ah, oh, you. F it was so good until then.